are now listening to the Ball Things Base Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ball Things Base Podcast. I am your host, Lee Keller, aka Lee Gordon, Lee No Martinez, Derek Leiter, Bill Lee Butler, Charlie Blackman, or you may better know me online as Cardicidal or Regicidal's Collection on YouTube. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you who tuned in to the first episode of the podcast. I appreciate all of you, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it, and I thought it went over pretty well. I'm excited to keep making new episodes of this for all of you, so keep coming back. All of the feedback that you guys gave me was excellent, but no one submitted any questions for this podcast. So, if you have any questions, whether it's about baseball in general, fantasy baseball, or baseball cards, tweet at BallThingsBase on Twitter, or my personal Twitter at Cardicidal, or email the show at the Podcast at gmail.com. I'm always looking to help you guys out and answer your questions, so feel free to ask whatever you want about baseball there. Now, before I get into the podcast, I want to give a huge shout out to my sponsor, Snups. If you watch my videos or saw the first episode of the podcast, you should know what Snups is, but if you don't, Snups is a free social media app for collectors. It's an incredibly helpful tool for organization and to interact with other people who collect the same things that you do. You can post pictures, create shelves for organization, join groups to talk with other collectors, and even list your things directly to eBay from the app. My baseball card group on Snups just reached over 500 members in it the other day, so make sure that when you download the app, you join my group called The Baseball Card Corner, and follow me on Snups at Cardicidal. Like I said, the app is fantastic, and it's awesome for people who collect not only cards, but shoes, clothes, or anything else you can think of. So make sure to download the app, iOS or Android, and check it out. Anyways, let's get into this week's podcast. So today, I wanted to do something a little different for the rundown. MLB.com just recently released their 2018 Top 100 Prospect list on the MLB Pipeline. We're not going to go super in-depth and talk about all 100, however, I wanted to focus on the top 10 best prospects and analyze their fantasy value and baseball card value. We're not going to talk about their real-life value because obviously these are the top 10 best prospects in the game, and when they're called up, they're going to help their team substantially, but the top 10 best prospects are at number 10, Michael Kopech, at number 9, Forrest Whitley, at number 8, Fernando Tatis Jr., at number 7, Nick Senzel, at number 6, Victor Robles, at number 5, Gleyber Torres, at number 4, Eloy Jimenez, at number 3, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., at number 2, Ronald Acuna, and at number 1, Shohei Otani. So to kick things off, we'll start with the number 10 best prospect on the list, who is Michael Kopech. He's a right-handed pitcher on the Chicago White Sox, he was involved in the Chris Sale trade, He was one of the main focal points, obviously, alongside Yon Mankata, who was the main prospect in that deal, but Michael Kopech is no slouch himself. He is going to be a stud. Now, I'm going to read off his scouting grades. If you're not familiar with the 2080 scouting scale, it basically means 20 is the worst, 80 is the best. I'll leave a link in the description below to that article so you can read more about the scouting grades. That way you can analyze prospects yourself in the future. It's very simple. If you read that, it'll be very helpful. I can't describe everything perfectly to you right now, so go and read that. Familiarize yourself with the scale. But for Michael Kopech, his fastball is an 80, his slider is a 65, his changeup is a 50, his control is a 45, and his overall grade is a 60. Now, the only thing keeping his grade down overall is his control, which is obviously a 45. But as he grows up and as he progresses in the system, he will gain more control. He will be able to handle his own stuff, and his stuff is nasty. His slider moves unbelievably. You have to see the motion. Go check on YouTube, Michael Kopech slider. Go look at his fastball. His fastball reaches triple digits. He's been clocked anywhere from 102 to 108. Apparently, he hit 108 last year in spring training. I don't get it. I don't know if that's real. I don't know if their guns were broken, but I believe it. This Kopech kid can throw heat, and his numbers reflect it. Between AA and AAA last year in the minors, he had a 9-8 and win loss. He had a 2.88 ERA. He pitched 134 innings, and in those innings, he had 172 strikeouts. He held batters to a 193 average, and he had a 1.17 whip. That is phenomenal. This guy is a stud in the making, so for his fantasy value, 
He is an absolute buy. Hold on to this kid with dear life. Don't let go of him. If you're in a keeper or dynasty league, he is someone you definitely want to hold and see how he progresses. He has all of the makings to be a stud. He reminds me of a young, which is absolutely crazy to say a young version of this guy because this guy is 25 years old, but he reminds me of a young Noah Syndergaard. He's got nasty stuff. He's got the heat. He can be everything that Noah Syndergaard is in a few years as long as he works on his control. So I would definitely buy him in fantasy, pick him up this year if he gets called up, no doubt, run, jump on your waiver wire, spend all your fab money, do whatever it takes to get Michael Kopech, because he is a stud in the making. I would hold on to him with dear life. As for card value, he's in the Chicago White Sox market, which isn't a great market. It's a pretty low-end market, they don't spend a lot, and the fans are mainly Cubs fans in Chicago. There's not too many White Sox fans anymore. When they start winning and their farm system gets brought up together, sure you'll see the bandwagoners join in, but Michael Kopech I think is a serious investment opportunity. He could be very likable, he could get traded, who knows what can happen with Kopech, but I am personally stashing up on him in cards because his stuff is going pretty cheap. I mean, pitchers are generally not a great investment, one injury and they're never the same, so I generally shy away from the pitchers, even though I super collect Noah Syndergaard, but for Michael Kopech, stock up on a few autos, why not? You can get a Bowman's Best Auto of his from 2017 for like $10. You can get his first Bowman Auto for about $40. You can get his 2017 White Sox first Bowman Auto for about $20. So he is going pretty cheap and he might be a very solid investment. I am holding him in cards. I am holding him in fantasy. Hold on to this kid. He is something special. Moving on to number nine, we've got Forrest Whitley. He's a right-handed pitcher on the Houston Astros, and obviously right now, all of the Astros have huge helium on their names, simply because they just won the World Series, but Forrest Whitley is no joke. His scouting grades are fastball 65, curveball 65, slider 55, changeup 55, control 50, and overall he's a 60. So him and Michael Kopech are both overall 60 on scouting grades, however they are definitely different pitchers. Michael Kopech is more of that blindly hurling 108 mile per hour velocity fastballs. Forrest Whitley is more of a toolsy fastball, curveball, slider, changeup, all four being swing and miss pitches, not trying to blow you by with heat. I mean, Whitley has a 92 to 97 mile per hour velocity heater, so he is not any slouch there, but Michael Kopech is trying to rear it by you, throw it as hard as he can. Whitley is more trying to pitch to you. He's trying to get you out. So for his 2017 minor league stats, he had a 5-4 and four win-loss ratio, he had a 2.83 ERA, he pitched 92.1 innings, and in those innings he had 143 strikeouts, he held batters to a 230 average, and he had a 1.21 whip. So all of that looks fantastic. Like I said, he's got a great arsenal. He was only in single A and double A last year, so he's quietly moving up the ranks. However, I don't see him pitching on the Houston Astros in 2018, so it kind of surprised me to see Whitley this high on the prospect list. Obviously, he's got nasty stuff. He's deserving of this rank, but I don't see him helping the team in 2018. I see him more of a 2019, 2020 call up. I mean, the Astros already have a ton of starters. They just added Garrett Cole. They've got Brad Peacock still, Charlie Morton, Colin McHugh. They still have a very, very deep pitching staff. So I don't see Whitley cracking the rotation unless there's a lot of injuries in 2018. So for me, Kopech would actually be ranked higher than Whitley because he can help you this year, but Whitley is definitely someone to keep on your radar. He's just got a lot of helium because the Astros are winning and he's a big prospect. So for his fantasy value, this year I don't think he's going to have that much of an impact. However, if he does get called up, go and grab him. He's going to be great. He's going to be someone you want on your team, a reliable, good pitcher on a good winning team. So definitely go and grab him. However, I think his fantasy value overall right now is a little inflated just because of the Astros. So right now, I don't think he's going to help anybody, but when he gets called up, whether it's this year or next year, he's definitely someone you want to own. So go and grab him wherever you can. Obviously in Keeper and Dynasty Leagues, you probably already own this guy, but he is someone you want to keep on your radar, see how he does, see how he progresses in AAA, and then make your move off of that. As for cards, 
I'm kind of staying away. His price went up a lot since the Astros won the World Series, and since this list came out. His cards have been going for, let's say his first Bowman autograph, around $40, and that's a lot. He was going for like $20 to $30 about three weeks ago, so he pretty much doubled his own price, and I don't want to touch that market. I've had one Whitley autograph, his first Bowman one. I've had one for about two months now. I got it at like $15. I'll hold on to that, but I'm not looking to invest in this guy. Like I said, the Astros have a lot of helium. He's on this list, and he's got a lot of helium, so just kind of stay away for now. Eventually, maybe he'll be a good buying opportunity, but I'm not buying it. I'm not going into that market. I'm not stocking up on him. I'll keep the one card I have, but not going too far in depth with Whitley. So overall, for fantasy, I am buying him. I think he's going to be a good pitcher. I think he'll have a lot of fantasy relevance, so I would buy. And for his cards, I'm staying away. I don't want any part of that market. I don't want any part of the inflated Astro market. Just stay away for now, maybe in the future, but as for now, stay away from Whitley. Coming in at number eight, we've got Fernando Tatis Jr. He's a shortstop on the San Diego Padres, and his name might seem familiar to you because his father, Fernando Tatis, played in the major leagues. He had a pretty decent career, but he's most known for his two grand slams in one inning. Yes, I said that right. Two grand slams in one inning. That is remarkable. I believe he's the only one in history to ever have done that. So that is pretty cool. If you've never seen that, look it up on YouTube. Definitely worth a watch. But we're talking about Fernando Tatis Jr., his kid. He is only 19 years old. Now, I know I haven't mentioned the age of other players, but people like this have a lot of time to progress. He's only 19. That's just mind-blowing. But his scouting grades are hit 55, power 60, run 50, arm 60, field 55, and overall, he is a 65. So he is looking pretty damn good. He's got a lot of potential at only 19 years old. I mean, look at his 2017 minor league numbers. Between single A and double A, he had 486 at-bats, scored 84 runs, he had 22 homers, he had 75 RBIs, 32 stolen bases, a 278 average, 379 OBP, 498 slugging percentage, and an 877 OPS. Now this is single A and double A of course, but at 19 years old, this is pretty impressive. If he goes on to AAA and starts going 20-20 homers and stolen bases, if he can get that batting average up to 280, 290, this guy is going to be a stud everywhere. So for fantasy, I'm going to say he is a buy. I am definitely going to buy this guy. I think we're going to buy every single prospect on this list, but maybe not. We'll see in the future. But Fernando Tatis playing shortstop, I mean... This guy is going to be great. If you can get a shortstop who's hitting 20 homers and stealing 30 bags, that's what we're hoping Carlos Correa does. I mean, this guy can be very, very helpful in fantasy baseball. So for that, I am saying he is a buy. Keeper, Dynasty, probably already owned, but definitely hold on to this guy. He's got a lot of potential. We probably won't see him for two years or so since the Padres aren't going to rush him, but definitely give him a chance to grow. He could be very, very special. For cards, I think I'm going to stay away on this one too, mainly because he's on the Padres. It's just a very small market. I mean, you look at Will Myers right now, who is pretty much the star on the Padres, and he went 2020 like two seasons ago, and his cards are pretty much dirt cheap. You look at anyone on the Padres right now, or in history, besides Tony Gwynn, they don't sell well. They just don't sell well. So as long as Tatis Jr. is on the Padres, I'm probably staying away. Now, I owned a few Tatis Jr. first Bowman autos. I believed I owned one refractor auto, which I bought for $60 originally, but I went to a card show and someone offered me $110, so I took that profit and ran away with it, and I'm not going to stock up more on him. If his first Bowman autos are going for $100 to $150, I'm staying away. I'd buy him for the right price, maybe $70, $80. I'll stock up on him a few autos here and there. Maybe if he pans out, he'll sell for more. But like I said, the Padres are a small market. Their main studs now don't sell for anything. So I'm going to stay away on this one. I would advise you to do so too. But if you believe in players with a lot of potential, he could be an interesting buying opportunity. So for fantasy, definitely buy. For cards, I would stay away. Like I said, his prices are a little too extreme right now for how far away he is from the majors, 
and also he's on the Padres, which is just a value killer. So stay away, maybe buy him for the right price, but overall, there's better investments to make. I would stay away from Tatis Jr. Next up, we've got number 7 on the list, who is Nick Senzel. He's a third baseman on the Cincinnati Reds, and this guy is someone that I saw with my own eyes in a showcase game, ripping the cover stock off of the ball. He just looked like he knew how to hit. He looked like he was in the majors for five years. He's someone who looks like he rips doubles in the gap for breakfast. So when I saw him hit in that showcase game, I said, you know what? This guy makes me really excited. As for his scouting grades, he's got a hit of 70, power of 55, run 55, arm 60, field 60, and overall, he is a 65. I completely agree with the hit tool being a 70. Like I said, I saw him live on a showcase game on ESPN, and he looked so good at the plate that I wanted to invest right there. I wanted them to call him up to the majors on the spot, and I would pick him up in fantasy immediately. For his stats across single A and double A in 2017, he had 455 at-bats, he hit 14 home runs, 65 RBIs, had 14 stolen bases, a 321 average with a 391 OBP, 514 slugging percentage, and a 905 OPS. So his homers and stolen bases are pretty even, not what you generally like to see out of your third baseman. You'd like to see a lot more power, a lot more home runs, the steals are a bonus, but you'd like to see someone stable like a Nolan Arenado, a Josh Donaldson, a Manny Machado, someone who rips homers for a living at third base. So that's what you generally look at for a third baseman. But when your third baseman has a 320 batting average, that's where things sway a little bit. He is extremely valuable in fantasy if he rips, let's say, 25 homers and steals 15 bags and bats 320, I will take that guy any single day. And like I said, with my own eyes, I watched this guy hit and he's got the talent. Trust me. His stats might not jump off of the page and slap you in the face saying you must own this guy, but I think he can develop into something really special. He's 22 years old. He's just in double A right now. He's got a lot of time to develop. The Reds are in no rush to call him up. So I think that this guy is going to be great. He's going to have a high average that will translate into the majors. If he goes 25 home runs, 15 stolen bases, and like I said, has that 320 average or even 300, he's someone who will be valuable. So for fantasy, I am buying. After seeing this guy hit, I am all in. I will buy him any day of the week give me as many shares as possible, especially with him hitting in Cincinnati in the great American small park. Give me that guy all the time. His homers may bump because of the park. His steals definitely will translate. He'll get you like 10 to 15 and his average will translate as well, like I said. So for fantasy, I'm all in. Buy him. As for cards, you know what? I'm buying him as well there. His value isn't too extreme. His first Bowman autos are going for about $70 to $80. I believe his refractor first Bowman autos are going for $100 to $120. So if you can grab one or two, he might be a good investment. I think he's going to be a great major leaguer. Cincinnati isn't the best market for cards, so I wouldn't fully stock up on him. But he's definitely someone I'd hold, wait for his value to increase, maybe dump when he gets called up and has a lot of helium. But he is someone that I would definitely invest in, fantasy and cards. I am buying on both fronts. Coming up next at number 6 on the list, we've got Victor Robles. He is an outfielder on the Washington Nationals. He is someone on this list that I am not too overly hyped about. He's the one guy on this entire top 10 that I'm like, eh, I don't know. His scouting grades are a hit tool of 60, power is 55, Run is 75, arm is 70, field is 70, and overall, he is a 65. Now, like I said earlier, the max a scouting grade can be is 80. His run is 75, his arm is 70, his field is 70. This guy is mainly a great fielder. He is going to be a great defensive player. Imagine someone like Kevin Kiermaier. Actually, that's a really good comp. He is pretty much going to be Kevin Kiermaier in the majors. Sure, he might steal more bases, but what I'm seeing out of him is a 10 to 20 homer guy, a 20 to 30 stolen base guy with a pretty good average and a really good defender. That is exactly Kevin Kiermaier. That's who I think he'll be. 
Now, I'm probably being a little bullish on the speed, on the stolen bases. He's got a 75 run, so this kid is fast. He should be able to steal a lot of bases, but I don't know where he's going to hit in the order. I don't know if he's going to have the green light in Washington. I know they have Trey Turner with the green light always, but I don't know about Robles. I'm not huge into the Nationals organization. I haven't seen this guy play live, but I am seeing him as like a Kevin Kiermaier guy. In 2017, across single A and double A, he had 430 at-bats, he hit 10 home runs, he had 27 steals, he had a 300 average, a 382 OBP, a 493 slugging percentage, and an 875 OPS. Now, he did get called up at the end of the year for the Nationals, he had 13 games played, he had 24 at-bats, he went 6 for 24, which is a 250 average, he had a 308 OBP, he hit no home runs, and stole no bases. Now, that is a very brief cup of coffee, so obviously not too many counting stats, but what? He had two runs scored and four RBIs? I mean, that's not a lot, so I don't know what to expect out of Robles. Obviously, 6 for 24 is not a lot of chances, only 13 games and 24 at-bats. We can't just say he's going to be a bust because of that short cup of coffee, but I don't know. I'm not feeling Robles at all, so for fantasy, to me, I'm not buying him. I don't believe the hype. I'm not a big fan of Robles. So I'll let someone else take him and gamble on the hype. But let me know in the comments below or on Twitter or email me. Do you know Robles? Do you follow the Washington Nationals organization? Is Robles the real deal? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think he's someone who will be great for fantasy. I think he's like Kevin Kiermaier. Probably a little bit better. Probably someone like Adam Eaton. But I don't know. He just doesn't profile very well offensively. Sure, his run tool is great, his hit tool is okay, he doesn't have a lot of power, I don't think his power will translate from double A to the majors, and he might be in triple A more this year, or he might start off in the majors, I'm not sure on his situation, but I'm not buying him for fantasy. As for cards, I'm also not buying him there. He's only 20 years old, he's got a lot of room to grow for fantasy and cards, but his card value is pretty high up there now that he's ranked number 6 on this list. I'm just not touching him. I'm not touching that market. I'm good. I'll let someone else invest in him. I'll let someone else grab him in fantasy. I'm good with Robles. If you want to believe the hype, go for it. But me personally, in my opinion, I am staying away. He's one of those guys that will be better in real life and a better real life contributor to a team than in fantasy or in cards. Next up, we've got one of the most hyped prospect names out right now. Number five on the list, we've got Glaber Torres. He is an infielder, shortstop, third baseman on the New York Yankees. His scouting grades are a hit tool of 70, power 55, run 50, arm 60, field 55, and overall, he is a 65. He's 21 years old. He was primed to make his MLB debut last year. However, he suffered an injury to his elbow, his non-throwing elbow, and I believe he needed Tommy John surgery. So sadly, that negated his chances of being in the majors in 2017. However, he is now healthy. He is ready to go. So hopefully, we will see him in the major leagues in 2018. He was the main focal point in the Aroldis Chapman trade with the Cubs. So when the Cubs acquired Aroldis Chapman, the Yankees got Glaber Torres. Now, I believe the Yankees wanted Torres specifically. They passed up on Eloy Jimenez. They didn't want another power-hitting outfielder. They wanted someone that can move around the infield. They wanted someone like Torres. So they grabbed him in the trade and ran away. But with that being said, his AA and AAA numbers in 2017 obviously were shortened due to his injury but he had 202 at-bats with 7 home runs, 7 stolen bases, a 287 average, a 383 OBP, a 480 slugging percentage, and an OPS of 863. This is a guy that will have immediate impact when he's called up. I think he will be the guy eventually who will hit 20 homers and steal 20 bags from the shortstop position. From a shallow position like that in fantasy, he is extremely helpful. He will probably hit anywhere from 270 to 290. He'll hit you anywhere from 10 to 25 homers and steal you anywhere from 10 to 25 bags. So if he can pan out and make that 2020 season, he will be someone that you want on your fantasy team. 
So as for fantasy, I'm going to buy him. I think he's someone that's very intriguing. I'll see him after his first year. I project after his first year, he'll have 15 homers, 15 steals, and a 285 average, which that can only go up. Like I said, he's 21 years old. He's got a lot of room to grow, and he can finally profile into that 20 homer, 20 steal guy from a shallow position like shortstop. So I'm buying him in fantasy. As for cards, he is heavily inflated due to him being a New York Yankee. The pinstripes make the value go crazy. His first Bowman autograph on the Cubs, those go for about $200. So I would stay away from those. The cards that you want to stock up on are his 2017 Bowman Chrome Autos where he's in a Yankee uniform. Those base autos are going for about $70 to $90. His refractor autos are going for $100 to $140. So you can find a pretty good deal on Glaber Torres. A lot of fans want to see him in a Yankee uniform. So his first Bowman auto usually gets overlooked. Obviously, it's the more expensive one. But when it comes to collecting and in New York, you generally want the guy in the Yankee uniform. So those Bowman autos might be a very good investment, especially if he pans out. If he does, those first Bowman autos will also rise, but he's a Yankee. His value is going crazy. I wouldn't buy unless you're getting a good deal. And if you have Torres, save him. When he gets called up, when he starts mashing, then sell him. He will be a huge investment opportunity. So for fantasy, I'm buying. For cards, I'm going to hold. I'm not going to buy, so to speak, but I would stock up on his Yankee uniform autos. His Bowman best auto from 2017 is only going for about $50, so that might be the best investment. But in general, I wouldn't really invest in Torres. If you have him, if you can get him for cheap, go for it. But don't jump off the deep end. Don't start investing heavily in him where you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on his first Bowman autos. Just keep it safe. Don't go all in. Be wary of his ceiling and don't let the New York hype blind you. At number four, we've got Eloy Jimenez. He is an outfielder on the Chicago White Sox and he was the focal point of the Jose Quintana trade. Now I think the Cubs are going to look back on this one a few years later and regret this trade. Sure, Jose Quintana is a great pitcher who's got a lot of years of team control, but Eloy Jimenez is one of the better power hitters that we've seen in recent time. With his raw power and his good bat speed, he's gotten a lot of comparisons to Giancarlo Stanton, Nelson Cruz, just the elite power hitters. So, with that being said, his scouting grades is a hit tool of 60, a power tool of 70, run is 40, arm is 50, field is 45, and overall, he is a 65. Now, he's only 21 years old. He was an international prospect in 2013, I believe, and he is someone who is just going to hit dingers. He's not going to be a great fielder. He's not going to steal bases. He's just going to hit dingers. Now, his minor league stats across single A and double A don't really reflect that. He had 333 at-bats. He hit 19 homers. He had 65 RBIs, one stolen base, a 312 batting average, a 379 OBP, his slugging percentage was 568, and his OPS was 947. So this guy is just going to hit dingers. Now, it might not reflect that in the minor league numbers, like I said. He hit 19 homers in 2017. In 2016, he hit 14 homers. Before that, 7. Before that, 3. So his power is developing. He's 21. He's got a lot of power. YouTube, Eloy Jimenez swing. You'll see him hit a bomb that was ridiculously far. He just looks really, really strong. He's 6'4", weighs 205. This guy is going to be a great power hitter. I'm going to compare him mainly to Nelson Cruz. I don't think he's going to be Giancarlo Stanton level, but I think Nelson Cruz is a good comp. I see multiple 40 home run seasons for Eloy Jimenez. I just think that he will be a really good professional major league power bat. Now that's not as desired anymore since everyone and their mother is hitting 20 homers in the majors. So he might even hit 50 homers just depending on how juiced the balls are. But power bats aren't as desired, but I think Eloy Jimenez will be at the top of the ranks in fantasy when it comes to power contribution. So with that being said, I think Eloy Jimenez is someone that you buy in fantasy, especially if you could get him really cheap. He's someone that will give you a lot of power if your team lacks that. The outfield is full of power. Like I said, homers are in abundance the last few years. So Eloy Jimenez might not be as valuable as he would have been back in the day. 
but as for now, he's still very valuable, he's still very young, in keeper and dynasty leagues, you should be excited to own him, in redraft leagues, he's someone that you might grab if he gets called up, if he gets a hot streak, keep him, if he doesn't, you can drop him, but he's someone that will develop over time, so in fantasy, I would buy him. As for cards, he's someone that I'm shying away from, mainly because he plays for the Chicago White Sox, and as I said earlier with Michael Kopech, the White Sox market isn't very good, so I would stay away from him for that reason, but also because when I compare him to other players that are similar to him, especially because he has such a boom or bust kind of potential, he's just not going to sell well. Nelson Cruz doesn't have many cards, but he doesn't sell well. If you look at Eloy's teammate, Jose Abreu, he's another guy who is an international prospect, came over to the White Sox, he hits 30 homers every year, 100 RBIs, and his market is trash. He is not worth anything. So when I compare it to Nelson Cruz, Jose Abreu, he just doesn't hold up. Like I said, I think Eloy will be very, very valuable in fantasy with that huge home run potential. But as for cards, I just don't see any room for him to grow market-wise. I don't think he's a very sound investment. There's a lot of other guys like the top three guys that I would rather invest in than Eloy. Because, like I said, Eloy can bust. Sure, he can come out of the gates blazing. He can have a 50 home run season. His value might go up temporarily. But I don't think he will hold a great value over time. So I'm just going to stay away from him. If you want to invest in someone that might hit 50 homers, that might hit 60 homers, maybe that next Aaron Judge kind of hype, then maybe go for it. But his base first Bowman autos are going for about $150. So it's a very steep investment if you're looking to stock up on Eloy. So for me... I'm going to buy him in fantasy, but I'm going to pass on him in cards. Now we enter the top three best prospects. At number three, we've got Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He is a third baseman on the Toronto Blue Jays, and this guy I am super, super excited about. He has all of the potential in the world. He's only 18 years old, and you heard the name Vladimir Guerrero Jr., he is the son of now Hall of Famer Vladimir Guerrero, Mr. Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes. I remember watching Vladimir Guerrero as a kid growing up and just remembering that swing, his vicious power, how he hit a home run that bounced in the dirt first and at a pitch that was above his head. I will never forget Vladimir Guerrero. I'm so glad that he's in the Hall of Fame. Definitely deserves it. But now the focus is on his kid and this kid is going to be amazing. Now for his scouting grades, he's got a hit tool of 80, a power tool of 65, run is 45, arm is 55, field is 45, and overall he is a 70. Now all of that is deserved, his hit at 80 is unbelievable. Like I said before, 80 is the max on the scouting grade scale, and his hit tool is an 80. That means he is one of the most elite hitters in the minors. I think he's the only one with a hit tool of 80. That is unbelievable. What I've heard is that he has the plate discipline of Miguel Cabrera and the power of his father. Imagine combining Miguel Cabrera's average plate discipline and his overall hitting knowledge with the power of Vladimir Guerrero. That is one dangerous hitter. Miguel Cabrera might be one of the best hitters that I've seen in my generation. And that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is getting comps to him with the power of his dad, which I witnessed personally along with Miguel Cabrera, put those two together and that makes one of the most dominant hitters in MLB history. So I am beyond excited about this kid. He plays third base. He's real young. He's 6'1 and weighs 200 pounds. Just someone that you can really get excited about. I mean, he's 18. How many times do I have to say that? He's 18 years old. I mean, that is unbelievable that he is getting comps to Miggy and his dad at 18. Now for his minor league stats in 2017, across single A, he had 437 at-bats, he hit 13 home runs, had 76 RBIs, he stole 8 bases, had a 323 average, a 425 OBP, a 485 slugging percentage, and a 910 OPS. This guy's stats at single A are nuts. He is going to get better. He's going to climb to double A, triple A, probably next year. You won't see him in the majors until 2020, 2021 maybe, but this kid is going to be dominant. 
The Blue Jays aren't going to rush him through the system. Like I said, he's 18 years old. He's only played in single A. So you're not going to see him next year at all. I don't even think he gets a cup of coffee. So don't bother with him in fantasy this year unless you're in a keeper or dynasty format. Obviously, he's owned probably and you want to jump all over him and hold him. But in fantasy, no questions asked. When he gets called up, buy him. Buy him with all of your fab money, spend everything you've got on him, make a trade to acquire him now in Dynasty. He is elite, and he's going to be dominant. He's going to be great at a third base position, which will probably be shallow by the time he reaches the majors, and I just love everything that he brings to the table. He'll give you a little bit of speed. He had 15 stolen bases in 2016 in the minors. He had eight last year, so he's not going to give you dominant speed, but he'll give you over five stolen bases. He's going to hit you anywhere from 30 to 40 home runs, probably 90 to 100 RBIs. He's going to bat 300. I mean, this guy is phenomenal. He's patient at the plate. He drives it to all fields. He's got real raw power. Just everything screams success with this kid. His dad is his mentor. I mean, I'm all in. Fantasy, buy. No questions asked, just buy. If you see in a headline, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. gets called up, buy immediately. Don't look back and just grab him. As for cards, I am all over him as well. He is not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. He's got a lot of helium towards his name. As he gets more hype, his prices go up, and it's definitely deserved. But right now, his first Bowman autograph is going for about $300. Now that is a big investment if you just want one autograph card of his, his first ever autograph. Now that is the high price way to go. You can go for his 2016 Bowman's Best Auto. That's about $80 to $100. That is more of a lower end investment. You can even go for his Donruss Studio Auto, which is like $30 if you just want a piece of him. But the Bowman Auto is the one you want. The first Bowman Auto, of course. And that is honestly a pretty good investment. $300 now might be $600 when he gets called up. So I'm going to stash him wherever I can. If I can get him for good values, I will keep his autos. I will stash them away. But he's definitely someone that can make that money back. When you invest heavily in someone, like when you go to invest in Eloy Jimenez, if you're spending $150 on his first Bowman Auto, you're hoping that that can at least double over his career. And honestly, I don't see that happening. For Vladimir Guerrero Jr., I definitely can. Sure, you're buying him at a high price right now, but when he gets called up, his price is going to skyrocket. So you want him now more than ever. You don't want to wait on this kid. Get him for as cheap as you can and wait to reap the rewards. So, for fantasy, I am buying him. For cards, I am buying him. He is a no doubt future success. I expect him to be in many all-star games. I expect him to follow in his dad's footsteps. I want him to be great, not only for fantasy, but for cards, and for his career in general, and for the Guerrero legacy. Coming in at number two on the list, who I honestly thought would be number one, is Ronald Acuna. He is an outfielder on the Atlanta Braves. This guy is getting comps towards Mike Trout, and honestly, with what he's done in the minors, he's looking like it. He's looking like the real deal. I don't know what to do with this guy because he is ridiculously hyped up, and for good reasons, of course, but he is just climbing through the minors at an astronomical rate. I mean, listen to his scouting grades. He's got a hit tool of 60, a power tool of 65, run is 70, arm is 60, field is 60, and overall he is a 70. So both him and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. are both overall 70s. However, Acuna doesn't have that hit tool 80, and Vlad Jr. doesn't have that run tool 70. So they're a little bit of a flip-flop like that, but listen to Acuna's 2017 minor league stats. Across single A, double A, and triple A, he climbed all three in one season. His stats were 557 at-bats, he had 21 homers, 82 RBIs, 44 stolen bases, a 325 average, a 374 OBP, a 522 slugging percentage, and an OPS of 896. That is unbelievable. He is elite in every single stat provided. And he climbed three minor league levels. That means by next year, he's ready for the majors. He is someone that can directly impact your fantasy team. He's someone you want to grab next year. You want to be in on him before it's too late. 
This guy is the real deal. If he comes up and starts shocking the world like Mike Trout or Bryce Harper, this guy is going to be unbelievable. This guy is going to go insanely high in value. I just don't even want to see the world where Acuna is lighting on fire because it's going to be scary. It's going to be really scary. This guy has a long line of baseball history. His grandfather was a pitcher and his father was a fellow outfielder. They both never reached the majors, but Acuna has baseball in his blood and he is ready to go. So I expect him to be ready for next year in the majors. He's going to get called up probably after the Super 2 thing, probably late April, maybe early May. He might start the year with the Braves, who knows, but he is someone you want a piece of. In fantasy, he is a definite buy. Get as many shares of this guy as you can. Try not to overpay. We never know what this guy will do in the majors, but he is looking very promising. It reminds me a lot of when Chris Bryant was being called up. It reminds me of Mike Trout's rookie season. This guy brings so much hype to the table, and it's most likely going to be worth it. So, buy him wherever you can. In fantasy, definite buy. As for cards, I don't know because his value is so high. I can't really say it's a smart investment, but like I said with Vlad Jr., you'd rather get him now at a cheaper price than what's going to happen two or three years from now. So Acuna has a little bit more direct impact on the market because he will be in the majors next year. Vlad Jr. won't be in there till 2019, 2020, who knows his timetable, but Acuna will be ready next year, so his prices can skyrocket. And just like Mike Trout, if he performs anywhere near that level, like the best baseball player on the planet, then his prices are going to go nuts. Mike Trout's first Bowman autograph card, for instance, goes for about $2,000. Anywhere between $2,000 and $3,000, depending on condition, grading, etc. But that's just for the base version. That means there's multiple out there. That means it's not numbered. Just the base version of his auto is $2,000. So if you invested in Trout, back when that card was $300 or $400 like Acuna's is now, it might pay off in the future like that. But it's a very risky thing to do because if he doesn't pan out, you obviously spent a lot of money and you failed. So Mike Trout is a once in a lifetime generational talent. Him and Bryce Harper are just different animals when it comes to talent. So will Acuna join them? I don't know. Is it smart to invest in his cards? I can't see the future, so I don't know. But I would rather stock up on one of his autos, maybe a first Bowman base auto, which goes for about $400 to $450. Keep a hold of that, and if he skyrockets in price, if he becomes the best player in baseball, you're going to profit a lot. So, if you're going to buy him, don't stock up heavily on him. Just invest in one piece and let it ride. Let's see where he goes, let's see how good he does this year, and if he lives up to the hype, then maybe you missed out on a better investment opportunity. But if you picked up one of his cards, you're going to be happy that you own a little piece of a very special player. You can always pick up a lower end autograph of Acuna's. He's got a Heritage Minor League Auto, which goes for about $200. And he also has a 2017 Bowman's Best Auto, which goes for about $70. So you can always pick up a lower tier auto of Acuna, or you can do the full deep dive and get his first Bowman Auto. But either way, he's a very special player. In fantasy, I'm all in, I'm buying, he looks amazing. And as for cards, he is someone that if you have any autos of his or any cards of his, hold on to them for dear life, wait for them to skyrocket, enjoy the ride, enjoy the profit. He is going to be great and he's going to be exciting to have. But if you're buying him now, remember that you're buying him at an all-time high of a price. You are paying the maximum hype price. So... Beware of that. If you're buying a first Bowman Auto, make sure that you know the risk ahead because he can either tank and lose everything that you bought or he can become the best player in baseball and make you a crap ton of money. So with that being said, I guess Acuna overall is a buy for cards, but buy at your own risk because like I said, you're paying for the hype price. And last but certainly not least, we've got number one on the list which is Shohei Otani. He is a right-handed pitcher and an outfielder on the Los Angeles Angels. He signed from Japan just this season, and he is a special type of player. He is a two-way player. Now, I talked a lot about Otani in the first podcast, so if you haven't given that a listen, go and do so. It's a good listen, a lot of good information in there. 
But Shohei Otani is a two-way player. That means when he's not pitching, he is playing the field, he is batting, he is being a beast on all fronts of the game. He is considered to be an all-tools player, which means he does it all. This is a guy you want a piece of in real life and in fantasy. Now for his pitching grades, he's got a fastball of 80, slider of 65, curveball of 50, splitter is 65, changeup is 50, control is 50, and overall, he is a 70 for pitching. For hitting, he's got a hit tool of 50, power is 70, run is 65, arm is 80, field is 50, and overall, he is a 60 for hitting. So, both of those extremely elite. Fastball 80 is the max. His arm for the field is 80. Obviously, he's a pitcher with a great arm, so that's an 80. Both of those are max. He is just amazing on all fronts of the game. He kind of reminds me of when you're playing a video game and you create a player and you set your stats to 99, you're on the mound, you're pitching 100 mile per hour heaters, then you step up to bat next inning and you're cranking grand slams left and right. He reminds me of one of those. That's the kind of character Otani reminds me of. Now, he's only 23 years old, he's 6'4", he throws a 100 mile per hour fastball, he can hit, he's amazing. He is just unbelievable, and he's going to change the game of baseball. We haven't seen a player like this since Babe Ruth. So that goes to show, this is something very rare. Now, a lot of players coming up are doing something like this, like Reds prospect Hunter Green, he is an amazing pitcher, he can also hit, as well as Rays prospect Brendan McKay. He also pitches and plays first base, so a lot more people are trying to emulate this, but Otani is the first to crack through, the first from the Japanese league. It's just a very interesting subject. Now, I'm not going to go over his stats. I did that in the last podcast, but as far as fantasy goes, I am buying this guy on occasion. I went over this in the last podcast as well. It depends what his value is. I don't think that he's going to pitch a lot of innings. He's going to have a little bit of a restriction. Coming over from the Japanese league, they might be in a six-man rotation. Who knows what Los Angeles is going to do? And he also might not get a lot of plate appearances. Albert Pujols is still on the team. CJ Krohn is still on the team. So I don't know who's going to DH, when he's going to bat. So I don't think he's going to have a substantial value this season. But next season, you're probably going to want to own him. He's going to have his innings pitched up. He's going to have that major league experience. We're going to see what he did this season. And we can see how many plate appearances he'll get. So with that being said, this season, I'm pumping the brakes a little bit on Otani. I don't really want a piece of him for where he's going in drafts. He's going to be very helpful. He's going to be very interesting. It also depends what your league settings are and what platform you're using. I know Yahoo split him into two different players. CBS is making him one player. So it all depends on that and all of those factors. But he's going to be someone really interesting to watch and to own. I think next year is his big year. This year is kind of a sample size, so to speak, just to see what you get from him. But I think in Dynasty and Keeper Leagues, this is a guy you're going to want to hold on to. He's got a lot of potential. Triple digit fastball, can knock in 20 homers. He is someone with serious talent, and he's definitely not someone to sweep under the rug. So with that being said, for fantasy overall, he is a buy. Not this season for me, but in general, he's a buy. Go for him, enjoy him, he's going to be interesting. As for cards, I said this in the other podcast, I think he's a very good investment, mainly because he's got the stability of the Japanese market, it doesn't matter what team he's playing for, he's got loads of talent, and that Japanese market is behind him. He only has one real card right now, which has a pretty set value, but during the season, that will rise, and also during the season, products like Bowman will come out, where he has his first rookie autographs, and he has two different versions of his rookie autograph, actually. Tops leaked a picture of it that he will have one American auto and have one Japanese auto. So that is going to mess up the market severely. The American auto is going to be three times less than the Japanese auto. I can already see it coming. The Japanese auto is probably super short print and everyone's going to want that one. So I'm predicting that here right now, hold me to my word that the Japanese auto will be a lot more money than the regular auto. But His autos are coming out, his first ever autos, so that's exciting. His prices are going to skyrocket. He is someone you want to invest in and grab wherever you can because he is going to be exciting, not just to watch, not just for fantasy, not just for cards, but overall, we haven't seen a player like this since Babe Ruth, so sit back, enjoy the journey. So overall, fantasy, buy, cards, buy, that's it. That wraps up the 2018 
top 10 best prospects according to MLB.com. That was your weekly rundown. Now it's time for the final segment of the podcast, which you all know as Lee's Leg Up, where I give you a player that I think is a smart investment, whether he's a great player, might see value increases in the future, someone I'm stocking up on, someone I like a lot for his value, and his cards are at a decent price. And that player this week is... Michael Kopech. Now, I wanted to choose someone off of the top 10 prospect list that we went over today, and I looked at Michael Kopech, and I think he has a lot of talent, and his card prices are very low. His first Bowman autograph card, the base version where he's on the Red Sox, is only going for about $40. His first ever White Sox Bowman autograph card, which is from 2017 Bowman Chrome, that's only going for $10 to $20. So you can buy Kopech cards right now for very cheap. It's a very minor investment. It's not going to put a huge dent in your wallet. Like I said, it goes against everything that I normally go for for investing. He's a pitcher, generally not good to invest in, and he pitches for the White Sox, which is not a very good market, but he's got a lot of talent. He'll have a lot of hype around his name when he gets called up. And at the very least, if you buy his cards now and you wait till he gets called up, you'll get a little $5 to $10 profit. So if you want to be a little risky, if you want to gamble, if you want to invest in a pitcher that won't burn a huge hole in your wallet, go for Michael Kopech. Anyways, that wraps up this episode of the Ball Things Based Podcast. I hope you all enjoyed. Make sure that you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snups at Cardicidal. Also make sure that you follow the show on Twitter at Ball Things Base. And if you want to submit a question for me to answer on the next podcast, either tweet at the Ball Things Base Twitter or send an email to the Ball Things Base Podcast at gmail.com. Subscribe to my channel on YouTube, which is Regicidal's Collection, and don't forget to follow the podcast on SoundCloud. Just search Cardicidal. But that's all for this episode. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Later, everyone.